Hi, this is Henk Ackermans and this is Smart Asset Management Vector 6. Section 6.3, Adoption of CBM within Asset Owners. We uh, look at how CBM technologies are being used in different parts of the triad. We will look at the OEM's role, but now we first focus on the Asset Owners. Now, um, we already saw in the previous section that uh, some of these Asset Owners are indeed not so forward uh, or not so advanced in their adoption of CBM technology, certainly not to the more uh, advanced uh, data-driven uh, CBM technologies. An example is steel manufacturing or, uh, let's say, oil uh, and, uh, processing. Um, and as it so happens, uh, my PhD student Roland van der Kerkhoff started six years ago a longitudinal case study with a steel company and an oil company with precisely that question, uh, what are these companies doing in terms of condition-based maintenance? And, and actually, uh, why aren't they more advanced? This was already six years ago a relevant question because these are huge companies with immense resources, billions of uh, of uh, assets and thousands of very capable engineers so surely if there's something possible that's clearly uh, has uh, in many cases uh, a, an excellent business case it's technically feasible why aren't they doing it then already and the expectation that we had at the beginning was that organizational factors may play an important part in this and so uh, roland went and had a look um, and there we have Roland, and this is the time, uh, the, the title then of its PhD thesis. It's about time to transition to CBM, the process industry. Now, what you would expect initially in terms of such an adoption is some kind of S-shaped growth, not bang all of a sudden, and also not uh, a very gradual increase. No, you would expect. And this is what we expect in many technologies, if it's broadband, internet, or the rise of Netflix or whatever, a slow start, then rapid increase, and after a while, some kind of saturation. And in fact, uh, that, that sounds like common sense, but as in many cases uh, of common sense, it's actually a theory by Rogers uh, a while ago, uh, but there are uh, many other theories that, 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 that support this, this pattern. So there is diffusion theory, as it's called, with a number of mechanisms there. There's the economy of scale logic. So the more that you do something new, the better you get at it. Uh, the, the relative, some of the expenditures that you have to make uh, are the same for a small as they are for a, a broader uh, base of applications. There are the increasing returns. Uh, so the more that you do something, uh, the better you are known for it. And so the more mark you get for it there's a certainty reduction in the beginning you're not sure if it will work and after a while you can be pretty sure there so a lot of buffers that you would have to take you don't longer have to take and there is even towards the end the threat of non-adoption the idea of leaving behind the, the idea of missing out uh, an important thing in our social media time um, Another set of theories is what we call institutional logic and here again there are some uh, very uh, um, learned scholars who've written about that in organization theory. And, and this is sort of how it goes. It, the, the, the institutional comes from how technologies get institutionalized, how they become normal practice within organizations. And, and there are multiple dimensions to this. There is the technical dimension. How the, is this a technology that's getting better, that fits actually with the problem at hand? There's the economical side of it. Is there a good business case? Is this cost effective? We already saw that this was often the case, as we already have seen that technically speaking, there are lots of things possible. But there are also things more specific to this institutional logic. There's the regulative aspect, the regulative institutionalization, by which we mean that initially it was forbidden and later on is prescribed. No, but really if the government or top management says this is what you should do, then actually the higher authorities tell you that you should do something and that makes adoption much more uh, quick, uh, like smoking uh, uh, outside or um, I don't know, a maximum as a speed limit to your car or many other things which are 
uh, uh, good for all of us, but may not immediately be uh, adopted by all of us. Then there are some more subtle normative things. You don't smoke in public because it's allowed, you get a fine, but actually you think it's it's not the thing to do. You shouldn't, uh, uh, it, it, that, that's, that's according to your norms, those are things you shouldn't do. So it's not just only that the boss tells you that you should use CBM, but also you think, hey, no, of course we use CBM. And even later, you forget uh, that, 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 that it becomes so logical, it's become so clear that that's what you should do, that it actually is more or less taken for granted. And last but not least, there's also mimicking behavior, the imitation of copying what others are doing. Of if everybody's getting solar panels, then probably it's a good idea for us too to have those. Now, uh, Roland looked at, uh, at, at 12 different cases, uh, six in the oil company, six in the steel company, at a variety, variety of technologies that all had to do something with condition monitoring and on different population of assets. Um, and uh, we were looking for this S-shaped curve. Well, it wasn't there. Well, yeah, the blue line is, but that's not one of our cases. The 12 other lines, those are our cases. And although it's difficult to put them all in one scale because the time from first to the application is often quite different. You see here one that has been going on for 25 years, but also the size of the implementation. You see that these are the number of assets that it applies to, and that varies from 25,000 to three. Um, but still, if you try and get one scale, then you see that the initial adoption can vary from, well, almost nothing to 100%. This was then an example of a regulatory move where it was actually prescribed uh, by the outside world that a certain technology should be used. Also, this gradual increase, where is it? it it's much more jerky, much more. There's often in more than half of the years, there's no change at all. There's actually some decline there. So a stabilization doesn't seem in sight and 100% of cases also doesn't seem in sight either. So where is our S-curve? Um, what you do see is some different patterns, and, and, and this is one way of grouping those 12 cases into three categories. There are two cases where there is a higher power, where the adoption is enforced by either the government or top management. And then you see initially a serious amount of, of adoption because, yeah, it's, it's the law more or less. The majority of cases in these two cases, in these two companies, was uh, uh, what uh, Roland calls the lone wolf. So there's this really engaged, knowledgeable CBM specialist that uh, for many years remains committed to increasing the application of the CBM technology. And over time, people adopt that uh, as, as, as a way to do, although it's very difficult to get the level of knowledge of that specialist. And there are some cases of a joint program where headquarters together with the local plant cooperate in making something and the local plant then is the pilot or is the, uh, the, 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 the local field lab, if you like, of, of, of what the central program is doing. And that, of course, reinforces each other. So there is that's one way of grouping it. You could say that in the higher power case is the regulative institutionalization. In the lone wolf case, it's the cultural, the cognitive institutionalization of adoption. This is just the, the specialist who says, this is, of course, we do this. And after that, everybody says, yeah, of course, we do that. And then there is the normative institutionalization. Hey, this is just how we run this business. We have a program for this. It's planned. That's it's how we do things. You can, and yet another way of looking at it is as a, uh, a whole nonlinear a uh, set of uh, feedback cycles where all these different uh, pressures uh, affect indeed pressure upon each other and may reinforce or slow each other. In the center, there is a stock of applications and new adoptions lead to more application, but there can only be ad abandonments. And then over a while, you can still, although the S-shaped curve is never found, talk about a number of stages. There's the initial stage where actually, if there's no improvement in the technical fit, yeah, then it's not gonna happen. After a while, when that technical fit, when there isn't a, a successful adoption, then the way of doing this becomes institutionalized. It's a normal way of working there. And then even after a longer time period, when that longer normal way of working is 
being observed by other parts of the organization, then the legitimacy of that way of doing it may also increase. But that can take years. What uh, Roland hasn't found yet is that the adoption is simply institutionalized. Of course, we use spreadsheets. Of course, people have a mobile phone and drive a car. There were times in the past when people didn't have mobile phones and didn't have cars, etc. But yeah, it's a normal thing to do. And in the case of CBM, we haven't reached that, 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 that level yet, I think. Uh, that may explain why the 100% adoption is, is relatively rare still. So, um, we see that the uh, CBM technology and the adoption context both determine the speed. There are the technical, the economic, and the institutional factors. What Roland adds to this is that he says, well, there are ceilings and there are borders. Uh, the ceilings, uh, they uh, have to do with it. why don't we go to 100% then? Well, for instance, because uh, if 100% is the total number of assets that this could apply to, then this technology only works for a certain fraction of that total number. Uh, so uh, there's a ceiling there, and unless we find a way of making it work for the other machines as well, uh, we're stuck at this level. Or there might be a border. We have it running here at this uh, facility, but in another facility, uh, it's not working. And yeah, we need the same specialist to do this. And well, we can't, uh, well, but geographically speaking, that, that's problematic. Or we need this uh, technology, this infra information infrastructure, and it's here, but it's not there at the other side. So then there's a border. And these things also slow down the adoption, you could say. In conclusion, we were looking at non-technical and also non-economical reasons for why adoption of CBM technology could be slowed down. And what we find out is that actually there are strong pressures there, else we would be seeing different adoption curves. But this technology can uh, become quickly adopted if, for instance, it becomes compulsory, if people already expect it or take it for granted, and if it's supported, if there is an implementation infrastructure, both uh, technically and organizationally and financially, uh, so if there are also sufficient resources. And what we then still expect to see, although in those uh, in these uh, 12 early cases, we didn't, uh, well, we saw quite some successes, but we didn't saw this gradual growth towards success, is that more at the population level, the CBM technology will become gradually more potent and less costly for asset owners and that they will continue to experiment and diffuse with more and more of these technologies and that they will use that information in more and more decisions. Uh, how fast that will go, that can be sped up with the right managerial interventions, yes. And what should you think of? Well, that's, that's a whole different topic. But uh, Roland already suggests, uh, well, let's think of different maturity levels where you are. Uh, maturity uh, models are quite popular in business. Uh, they tell you where am I now and what's the next stage. So uh, usually the first and the last stage are pretty meaningless because nobody wants to be in the first stage and nobody is going to get to the fifth stage. So we then keep uh, stage two or three and four. Reactive CBM is, I think, where these companies are coming from, but they are no longer there. So they only use the condition monitoring technology when they see something that they don't understand, they have to figure out how it works. With planned CBM, they use it structurally and they use the less advanced of, uh, ways of working. But it's not yet proactive CBM, where you actually drive hard to use more and more of this technology to uh, get the most out of its potential. Um, and, and their management can actually make a difference to move from reactive to planned and from planned to proactive. Now, this is the story for the asset owners, how it works out for the manufacturers of assets, for the OEMs, uh, we'll see in the next section.